we should have been, I guess, approaching the Olympics this year, but obviously that's been postponed because of coronavirus and is now hopefully happening uh, in, in Tokyo next year. But um, are the memories still pretty clear in the minds of that of that day in, in Rio when you when you won gold, scored one of the penalties in, in 2016? Just one of those moments that will live with us forever. I think uh, I think that the moments that you saw on TV as well, the ones that we probably don't go to straight away in our minds. It's those. It's the, the moments that happened afterwards in the changing room when we're all to, together on our own with no cameras around. They're the kind of the really special moments that nobody gets to see. Um, mm, yeah. And they're, they're they're just they're just magic. Really magic. Um, look, Kate, I know you were like the captain forever, uh, but you didn't take a penalty. <laughs> Helen did take a penalty. So just talk us through, step by step, what it feels like to take a penalty and how predetermined you allowed it to be or how out of control you wanted to be to order to be able to react to the Dutch keeper. Yeah, so there's obviously the two different types of penalties now in hockey. So the running penalty, which you see seen in ice hockey for years, um, where you have eight seconds to score the goal um, and the, the goalkeeper, it's a one-on-one -on -one essentially. Um, and in that scenario, um, I had, a th I had a, a plan up my sleeve that I wanted to try and execute. Um, and, but you do have to adjust a little bit depending on what the goalkeeper is going to do. Um, so I had a plan and I wanted to try and execute that. Unfortunately, I didn't um, score. <laughs> um, I didn't score my running penalty. Um, but, you know, the goalkeepers have a, a much better, um, hmm. better chance in those penalties. And, and as you saw with our goal, goalkeeper, Maddie Hinch, you know, she made all, she saved all of theirs. Um, but with the penalty from the spot, it's a completely different game. Um, you know, the, the odds are stacked against the, the, the attacker. I knew exactly where I wanted to put it. Um, I'd even thought, so I've taken a few penalties against this goalkeeper before, and they've, I've put them all bottom left, and that is my, that's my spot. That's where I have to go, really. Um, mm. And so I wanted to go bottom left, but I thought <clears throat> the last few times I'd put them probably about this height off the ground. Um, and so I knew that I thought, right, if I put it on the floor, then that's got a better chance. Um, I mean, there's so much mental preparation. I'd learned over the years what I needed to do physically. Um, when the whistle went, the umpire signaled a penalty stroke. Um, I need to make sure that I kind of step, you know, straight away I'm stand up tall, shoulders back. Yes, in my head, I'm saying to myself, I want to take this. Um, because I've had a bad experience in the past where uh, an umpire has blown or, you know, for a penalty stroke and in my head straight away, I'm, I wasn't ready. Um, and I thought, I don't want to take it. Um, and then it ended up somebody else taking it and then them missing. And I really learned from that experience that as soon as the umpire blows the whistle, gives a penalty, I need to tell myself, or I need to have told myself the night before, actually, that if we get a penalty stroke, I want to take it and I'm going to put it bottom left. And I've already gone through that process. Um, so when Sophie Gray got fouled in the, in the shootout and the umpire blew for a penalty stroke, straight away in my head, I want to take this. And, um, and actually when I was making the long walk up to the spot, which is when a lot of those things that you've planned in your head um, can then go mm. awry. <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, all the doubts will start to creep in at that moment. Um, the Dutch fans started booing, which is really unusual. Normally it's silence, mm. and silence is actually just the worst thing. Um, yeah. And they started booing. And all those years <laughs> of playing, 17 years we were in the team, it actually it started to come back. And I was, I literally said to myself, right, this is it. You've got a chance to make happen what you've been wanting to make happen for however knows how long, just do it. And it made me angry that they were booing, which anger for me is a, a good thing. So it got me angry and I was like, oh, this is going in. And uh, 
Yeah, after it, if, if you watch it back, you see um, after I scored, I'm walking back to my team and I just look over at the Dutch, um, the penalty takers, I'm like, give them the biggest evil ever. <laughs> 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 I've seen a brilliant still of the two of you. Now you weren't standing right next to each other, were you? You were, there was, you had a teammate in between you. There's a wonderful shot of you high fiving each other. Um, I mean, obviously it was a it was a, an amazing moment, but particularly for you two, being the first same sex married couple to win Olympic gold. I mean, talk talk to us about that. I think just I think standing on that podium with teammates was just amazing but there was definitely a sense of we've done it you know that's 17 years our first olympics was sydney 2000 we finished eighth out of ten and we didn't qualify for athens in 2004 and then we were sixth in beijing and we almost got there in london with the bronze and then it was like we've done it and it was we we're in number order on the po on the podium so we had susanna townsend between eight and eleven um, and so we could just lean back and just have a little We've done it, uh, and it was it was incredible to share that moment. I feel very lucky to be able to share that moment with Helen. Five wants to get involved as well, apparently. Maybe five, huh? Or she can she can look at that picture one day. Yeah. <laughs> Helen, what are your what are your memories of that of that Yeah, I think yeah, it was very much similar. You know, as Kate said, seventeen years and. For me, it was almost like we can stop now. <laughs> we can stop. <laughs> Don't have to keep chasing this. You were eighteen, anymore. right? You were eighteen when you started your Olympics. Yeah, the so, youngest yeah, ever. So eighteen in Sydney. Um, Kate was twenty, so we were both really young uh, when we first got into the team, first at our Olympic Games, and it was it was a long, hard road um, with so many so many downs um so many challenges yes obviously there were amazing um positives and highs as well along the way but there there was lots of downs um mm -hmm. and so in that moment and being able to share it with with kate was incredible um and something not many people get to do and i think that it also then has helped us moving away from the sport um because we just get each other we just understand you know, it's hard to stop doing the thing that you've done all your life. Um, and because, and, you know, I would carry on playing forever if I could, if my body allowed me to, but it doesn't, and you have to stop. Um, and so the odd occasion, you know, one of us might just wake up in the morning and be like, I just feel like today. I feel like rubbish. And I don't know why. And the other one would just be like, that's okay. You know, we, I get it. And, and that's really nice to be able to have that and not have to explain yourself. Um, yeah, I think that's really precious. What, one of the interesting things I've found uh, is the ability to look back with hindsight with the medal in the sock drawer and describe those moments, those down moments as positives. Now at the time, they weren't positives, like end of the world, another grand slam, blown. Oh my gosh, what we've we done. You look back on it and you go, well, actually learning how to manage those sorts of games. So which were the, because we know there's a happy ending here and we get the goal, which were the moments <laughs> that you just thought at the time that the world, you'd rather the world opened up big hole and you'd fall through because you couldn't <laughs> see any way you were ever going to achieve your dream. I mean, where do you want us to start, Will? Um, <laughs> I think the first one was quite, was pretty formative for me. It was was 2004 when we failed to qualify for the Athens Olympic Games. Um, top, it was a, we'd had an opportunity to qualify. We'd missed that. This was our last chance to qualify. It was, uh, I think, 12 teams, top five qualified. We were the top ranking team at the time going into that qualifier, so it should be fine. Five teams qualify, we should be fine. Um, but we it, we weren't in a good place, and that kind of ranking wasn't really where we were as a as a group. And it just it just slowly just went away. Every game, just we, we were winning two 0 in our first game, we drew it two two, and it it just each game just started to get further and further away from us. And it came down to a game against South Korea, 
which we needed to win in order to, to get an opportunity to play for that fifth spot. And we lost that game 2-0. And um, I still get very emotional about it now because it, it's I, I can absolutely put myself in that moment, the final whistle when and just being on that field with, you know, players 10 years my senior who probably knew at that point that was their last time they were ever going to pull on that international shirt. And to have to kind of, as a young captain, I was 23, have to kind of help some of those players off the field um, was was just was so incredibly powerful and it ignited something in me which then powered me for the rest of my career. I, I did never ever wanted to let that happen again. Um, and you know, afterwards, the aftermath was almost worse. We lost seventy percent of our funding as a sport. What little we had, anyway, and and it was it was really hard going for it for a few years. And it was it was that was really powerful for me. I think my hardest moment was in twenty fourteen. So um, not long before Rio, really. Um, twenty thirteen, one of my discs in my back ruptured, um, and I needed surgery. Um, so I had surgery, and I got back onto the pitch. Um, but then 11 months later, the same thing happened again. So in 2014, I needed more back surgery, which is a, was really you know, a frightening place to be when you're having surgery on your back. Um, you know, you just kind of, the fear there of what can go wrong, I think is very real. Um, and because of that surgery, I missed, well, because of my back and it was very close to a World Cup. Um, and I tried to get back for that World Cup, but it, I mean, the target was getting selected after nine, nine weeks after back surgery, which when I, when I say out loud now, I just think it's crazy, but I tried to get back for that World Cup and I didn't make it, I didn't get selected. Um, and so I missed out on that World Cup and I felt like I was in a place where I could have got selected, um, but I didn't. And so the, for the first time, I got dropped from a squad that I felt like I should have been in. And that was really hard because, um, I mean, that, you know, challenged everything about me. My, my ego was probably the hardest thing that got challenged in that moment. But I also then felt like that was the end because there was a new coach in place. Um, my body was clearly struggling. I didn't know whether I was going to get back from this second surgery. Um, and I thought that was, I thought that was the end. I thought that was going to be the end of my career. Um, and so that was, that was definitely my lowest moment. And I, you know, really struggled with my mental health at that moment. Um, and both, I mean, for both of us, 2014 was a year that was pretty awful. Um, but again, you know, a year that we, we managed to get through and kept driving us. Um, more learn, more learnings took place and helped us with, without doubt in those last two years to get to Rio.